John chapter one, and we're all the way down to verse four. We have just shot through this so far. We're going to make a make up a little ground tonight, I think. But um, uh, it's pretty, it's relatively straightforward stuff here. So we'll see what we can do. All right, verse four says, "In Him, who is the Him? Jesus. In Jesus was life." And that life was the light of man. Uh, the idea here is a continual action. The verb is continual action, which means God has been been on the earth, connected to the earth, and dealing with people uh, through his son uh, for, all, for all eternity. Um, the idea of life is uh, the personality and character of God. Uh, he was life, or he was a personality and a character. He was a real person as opposed to just a spirit. It's not just a body, but it, it is, in fact, a spirit and uh, a spirit within a body. Uh, the light is the no idea of knowledge, and wisdom, and understanding, which is what he uh, gave to men about God. Later on, we'll, we'll see Jesus say that if you want to know God, you need to know me. When they ask, well, where is God? What is God like? What's the Father like? He said, well, if you know me, you know the Father. So he is that understanding. He brought that understanding, attempted, attempted to bring that understanding to the world. Um, <clears throat> anytime you talk about wisdom, real wisdom, is in Christ. Uh, without Christ, without God, there is no wisdom. Um, everything is foolishness. Uh, Jesus was with his people. Uh, he was demonstrated throughout the Old Testament. He was, I mean, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it was him as, as a figure, but he was represented or came in the form of a rock. When they struck the rock, that was a form of Christ. You've got a cloud and a cloud of uh, by day and fire by night. That also is a form of Jesus be, being with, or God being with his people, which would include Christ. Um, and by the way, I don't know if I've ever said this in here because I don't teach, haven't taught the Old Testament that much or Exodus, but I, want, I, I don't know if you remember, but if you grew up with uh, either teaching with or using uh, flannel board material, uh, do you remember that? Do you remember that cloud that led the people, and it's a column, you know, went from the earth straight up. Okay, probably not. More than likely, it'd be more logical for it to be a cloud that spread over the sun to protect the Israelites as they went through uh, Egypt in the desert. So probably we got a, we may have a little bit of a misunderstanding there because of our visual aids. Uh, visual aids can sometimes be damaging because they can visually show you something <clears throat> and you have it in your head from that point on, as a, particularly as a child, <clears throat> that that's what it had to look like. And of course, I wasn't there either, so I don't know what it looks like. But um, I have relatives that were known. <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea, but it only makes sense that the cloud that led them by day uh, would be something that would, would be more, because also, please understand or remember, how many Israelites are we talking about here? Amen. About me. Well, it'd be a little hard for that one little funnel cloud looking thing to be much of a direction to a million people unless they were strung out halfway around the world in a column of two. So more than likely, they were a much wider band of people, therefore the cloud would need to be wider, and also the, the fire by night would have to be wider than that uh, column, uh, cloud and pillar of fire that we're that we have in our heads because of the pictures and the illustrations we've seen. Just that's a side note there, you, you don't have to pay for that, and it won't be on <laughs> and it will not be on the test. Um, okay, so <clears throat> if, if Jesus was with the through God, <clears throat> God through Christ was with the children of Israel through the through all that time in these different forms. How is Christ with us today? 
I mean, we we say he's here. How do you, how do you, how, what, what form do you know him? How would you know that? There's only, there's only one answer to this. This is not a trick question. Holy Spirit. Do what? Holy Spirit. Well, Holy Spirit, but how's the Holy Spirit do, with us? Okay, how is it with us? I'll take that one too. How do you have the Holy Spirit? How does, how does the Holy Spirit or Christ or God, how do they communicate with us today? To that we pray to them and they communicate with us through what? Right. right, the scriptures. Okay, it's by scripture that we know what we know about Christ, about God, and about the Holy Spirit. So, how does the Holy Spirit, when someone says uh, we are directed or led? which is a biblical term. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But I'm saying when the Bible says we're led by the Spirit, how does the Spirit lead us? You got it right the first time. Go for the same answer and you'll get it right again. Revelation. Through the Scripture, okay? In other words, it's not God talking to us directly or a still small voice as as God appeared to Elijah at one time, but rather it's through Scripture. Therefore, if you want God to communicate with you more readily, what does that require? That requires that I know or understand or study more Scripture. Okay, it all gets back to Scripture. So someone says, well, Roger, have you ever been teaching a Bible class? And I have done that occasionally. Have you ever taught a Bible class and suddenly something came to your mind that you presented in the class that you didn't have in your outline? Yeah, right now, for an example, this isn't in the outline. Okay, what prompted you to do that? Well, you can say the Holy Spirit did, okay? But how did he do it? Through my remembering a scripture or an idea or an illustration from the Bible that he could remind me. I, be I believe, and this is my opinion based on my understanding of scripture, but my opinion, I believe that we are prompted by the Spirit, but we're only prompted because we know the scriptures that he can prompt us with, okay? The more scripture you know, and I don't mean memorize book, chapter, verse. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an understanding of scripture. Now, if you got it memorized, that's so much the better. But <clears throat> when you hear, when you're talking to someone, let's say you're in a conversation about scripture, and a verse comes to your mind that you didn't think of before, one in your quote outline, it's just all of a sudden it's it's like wow that that's the right scripture for the answer to that question. But if you never read that or never studied that, I don't think it would have come to your mind. In other words, God doesn't put words in our minds or in our mouth that we haven't at least looked at and studied. But the more we read, the more we study, the more we understand the more readily Christ and uh, the Spirit, God through the Spirit, can prompt us to say the right thing at the right time with the right scripture. Uh, I'll let me illustrate it this way. In all, and I'm, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but not totally. In all your times of remembering or saying the right thing at the right time, and that's being <clears throat> claimed, you could claim it was you were prompted by the Spirit. People claim that all the time, and I'm not arguing with them. I'm saying, how many times has a verse from Lamentation come to your mind? Not often. I can go one further and I can say, how many times has a verse from the Song of Solomon come to your mind? And I get even, even less nods of heads, okay? Why? Because we don't study those books that much. There's a couple of verses in Lamentation that are used occasionally, and you might remember those. Song of Solomon, not likely anything. 
Now, how is, how is Jesus with us on the earth today? He's with us through the scripture because we know about him via the scripture. We communicate with God and we say, well, he intercedes for us. And he does. There is no doubt about that. But if you didn't have the scripture, you wouldn't know that. There's no way you could know that Christ is interceding for you if you didn't have scripture that says Jesus is currently interceding for us with the Father. So we know where he's at. We know what he's doing. Not every, not, you know, complete, total, absolute, I know everything Jesus and God are doing. I don't. But I have a general understanding of what they're doing. But without scripture, I wouldn't have even a general understanding of it. There's no way I could figure it out. I mean, there's no way you know that. Uh, it's the same principle as uh, the gospel. I can know <clears throat> by watching nature, according to, uh, according to Paul in Romans, I can know about God without any scripture at all. But there is no way that I can understand what to do to be saved without scripture. I can talk to God. I can believe in God. I can see evidence of God as, as many people do every day. But without someone to preach the gospel to them, they will be lost because you cannot figure out the gospel. You cannot figure out the God's plan of salvation without scripture. It's the only, and, and someone to preach that scripture, to teach that scripture, to, to explain that scripture. Now, you, you possibly could take a Bible and maybe you could figure it out on your own, perhaps. But God really never intended for it to be done that way. Well, how do I know that? Because he says to his disciples, to his followers, which includes us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, why don't we just, wouldn't it be easier just to take airplanes and fly over countries and drop Bibles? Except for hitting the poor people in the head with the Bible. Uh, hopefully they'd get out of the way. But wouldn't that be easier? And we could translate it into their language. I mean, that, that's not hard. That's feasible. Why don't we just do that? That'd be a whole lot quicker and easier than, than preaching and teaching and all that to get people in a frame of mind to go and do that because God said that's the way he wants it done. Could he have done it a different way? Of course he could. There's no limit to the way God could have done it. But there is a limit to the way God did it. And God said, I'm going to send these 12 men to preach the gospel and teach others to carry it to 12 more, to 12 more, to 12 more until the whole world is covered. Now, most of that's free. A little of that might be on the test, but not much of it. Okay. Verse 5. The light <clears throat> shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not, uh, has not understood it. The darkness, according, if you use different versions, the King James Version uses the word comprehend, did not comprehend it. In other words, they didn't understand it. If you use the uh, American Standard Version, you get the idea of ap uh, apprehend, which is to grab hold of it. See, I told you you'd have to unlock the door for him. The idea, the idea of, of it being apprehend, which is the word the American Standard Version uses, that's the idea of grab a hold of it. The darkness, it was there, but the darkness didn't grab a hold of it. And then uh, the Revised Standard Version uh, uses the word um, overcome, which means uh, the darkness did not overcome the light. It boils down to the idea that while darkness, the world, did not understand it, did not comprehend it, but the darkness couldn't defeat it. God, uh, Christ coming to the world was the light. 
and that light was unbeatable. Uh, the light's going to win, and no matter what, and no matter how hard the darkness tried to overcome it, what was the main what was the main way darkness tried to overcome the light? By having it killed. Wouldn't that generally work? I mean, you know, if you want to defeat somebody or something, uh, it's a general rule, not always, but as a general rule, if you take the leader out, the one promoting it in some fashion, especially if they're executed, it usually slows the movement down, or at least, or sometimes it even stops. I mean, there, you know, it stops. Take the head off the snake. Well. Exactly. You take the head off the snake, the snake dies. Be careful not to get bit by the head of the snake that you think you're <laughs> already dead, but other than that, uh, you're, you're correct. Okay. Well, um, it didn't matter what darkness did because it killed, it thought, it killed the problem when Christ was crucified. What in fact really happened at crucifixion, it didn't kill it, it promoted it. It did what God intended to have done. God intended for his son to be <coughs> crucified and killed on the cross. And that thing would lead to resurrection, resurrection which would lead to the gospel overcoming Satan, according to uh, Genesis three and verse five, uh, you know he, he would he would bite his heel or, uh, and he would crush his head. So yes, he did have some effect, but instead of it killing him, it only ended up in him having his head crushed, which is a very good way to kill a snake. Uh, even better than cutting its head off is to crush its head. And you're even more likely not to get bit, okay? So, but that's the idea. Jesus continues to be the victor, no matter what. Darkness could not overcome it. Now, <clears throat> beginning in verse 6, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we leave the subject of Jesus directly and we go into John the Baptist, uh, or John the Baptizer. Uh, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness of the light. So John the baptizer did not just accidentally appear. It's not by, by some uh, fluke that this man appears and begins to teach because he was sent as an as it were the same word here for sent a man sent is the same word for apostle he's not called an apostle and he's not an apostle of jesus because he comes before jesus but the idea of someone being sent with a message is the idea of an apostle and that's what john was uh, he came to bear witness that was uh, to convince the jews that Jesus, who was coming behind him short, very shortly, was the Messiah. This is the one they've been waiting for. And John is the one who takes, uh, who's given the commission by God to make, proclaim that information. Uh, I'm not the Messiah, he'll say, but the Messiah is coming. Um, now they honored the, many of the Jews, not all, but most of the Jews, honored John the Baptist to a degree as a, what? Possibly a prophet, uh, a preacher, no, for sure, uh, a good teacher, by the way, you know. But guess what? I don't believe a word he's saying. And what I mean, the Jews in general, there were obviously converts, but... But basically, the Jews didn't, uh, certainly the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, they didn't, they knew he was out there, but they had no interest in the message that he was uh, promoting or saying, even though his job was a forerunner. Now, what is a forerunner? That's someone that runs in front of someone else, ahead of someone else. He's there for a purpose. He's there 
to get people ready and aware that the, the Messiah that they've been waiting for is now fixing to make an appearance. Um, in verse 9, the true light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor a parent decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. All right, let's look at this a little bit. Um, the idea that, that uh, up, there to, uh, up there in verse, uh, um, what are we on, eight, nine. On verse nine, the idea of that one uh, relates back to the verse eight which shows it was Jesus and not John the baptizer. Uh, he was true. Jesus is the only authentic light. There is no other light. He is the only true light. Uh, we are become a form of Jesus in the fact that we become a form of the light of the world. How do we become the light of the world? Because we have the message that brings light to the world. We're not Jesus, we're not the light by any means, but we are a reflection of that light. And that light is the light of the gospel that brings men to know God. Um, it says he brought to every man. Oh, now that that's not surprising to us. We go, of course he did. Of course, what else would he do? But think about it from a Jewish perspective. What does every man inc include? Gentiles. Gentiles. Whoa, now there's a shot. You know, early, 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 you see in Jesus' ministry, and before he even starts ministering, John's already talking about the fact that he's coming to bring the light to all men. Well, now you gotta understand. That when a Jew hears the word all men, that doesn't bother him. Why? Because the only men are Jews. Remember, Gentiles don't qualify really as, as men, as such in their understood, spiritual understanding. Much the same as or before, long before the Civil War, uh, the slaves. We're not, all men are created equal. That's what it says. Thomas Jefferson, one of those, one of the guys that wrote all this stuff, he writes, all men are created equal. And yet, wait a minute, what about that slave? Well, he's not a man. Slaves were not men. They were animals. They were property. They were things that you bought and sold. So it didn't bother them. There's no conflict in their thinking to say all men are created equal and have slaves because the slave was not considered a man. He eventually got to be what in this country? You history majors out there remember what, he, what they finally decided a slave was? He was three-fifths of a man. <laughs> How they came up with three-fifths, I've never understood why not half a man or four-fifths or, you know, eight-tenths or whatever, but Three-fifths was what they decided a slave represented in terms of numbering. All right. So there is a... <clears throat> there is a goodness about... Uh, overall goodness about man. Man is overall good as God created him. Because God said what he created was good. But... Sin comes along and tarnishes that goodness and changes that goodness. Uh, now, goodness, and this is a very important concept that a whole bunch of people do not want to accept. Goodness does not equal 
salvation. Okay? That's crucial because a whole bunch of people say, well, surely God couldn't condemn Joe or Bill or Susie or Mary because look how good they are. I mean, they're better than a whole bunch of people I know. I am, you know, <laughs> Susie's better than half the women that go to church where I did. You know, she's just that kind of woman. She's really a good woman. She's good, but she's a part of the body of Christ. So, under, with our definition, not God's, but with our definition of good, Will there be good people in hell? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, that's true. That's not a pleasant thought and not one that we like. Still true. And very important we understand it because it's very easy for us to say there really aren't any lost people in the world. That may come as a shock to you because you say, well, of course they're lost. But really? Well, let's, let's run through a few real quick, okay? How about the man that never heard the gospel? Is he lost? Surely God wouldn't condemn somebody who never heard the gospel. Well, that takes out a whole bunch of folks right there. And then what about the people who are born into a society where they have no chance to hear the gospel? Say the Muslim group, Muslim community. I mean, it's going to be difficult for a Muslim child living in a Muslim world, raised by Muslim parents in a Muslim society, they were hear the gospel. Surely God wouldn't condemn that person. He didn't have a chance. He didn't have any chance at all to hear the gospel. Well, what about people who live uh, and are raised in a denominational world where the denomination they attend is a very good group of people. I mean, you know, they cut the grass, they don't kick the dog, they water their yard, and they vote Republican. I mean, what, <laughs> what, what, what more could you want? Apologies to any Democratic listeners we have or anybody here, but, but, but that's how we judge people. You know, and we say, my word, couldn't be lost. Well, when I get to listing all these different possibilities, I'll ask you then, who is lost? And I'm sorry, but many of my brethren don't think anybody is. Or they're not sure. Or they say, if you well, if you think they're lost, then you're being judgmental. Well, no, I'm not. Because it's not a matter of what I think. And it's not a matter of what you think. It's a matter of what does the Bible say. Go into all the world. The Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore it's sin. Okay? That's what the Bible says. I didn't say that. It wasn't my idea. But that is what it says. Well, if all have sinned, then all are lost without what? The blood of Christ. How do you come in contact with the blood of Christ? through obedience to the gospel. Therefore, if you don't hear the gospel, regardless of the circumstance, whether you've lived in a part of the world where there is no, where it hasn't been taught, or when you live in a world where it has been taught and you haven't listened. But without the gospel, what are you? Lost. Lost. That's sobering, because it's much easier to, to believe what we generally believe. And that is that, well, I, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the judge. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. So, well, Roger, you saying everybody's lost. I'm saying this is what the Bible says. Now, can God open the gates of heaven to people who are not members of the body of Christ? Of course he could. I don't expect that, <clears throat> only because it kind of violates his character to do that, to, to, to have something taught and then at the last minute change his mind or, or you know, but it should, should he do that? Would I object? No. 
if and I do not believe there are pearly gates, by the way, but if I get to the pearly, or when I should say, when I reach the pearly gates, and the person opening the pearly gates is Adolf Hitler, I'm not going to say, God, I'm not going in because you let him in. I don't expect him to be there for very good reason. But should he be there, that's God's choice. But I'm not going to risk that everybody um, with Adolf Hitler's uh, spiritual credentials is going to be in heaven. So therefore, I'm not going to count on that. So how do I, how, what is my role? My role is to look at the scriptures and obey them. And the scriptures clearly say, without any, without any doubt, that belief, repentance, confession, baptism are absolutely essential to becoming part of the body of Christ. So that's what I'm going to teach. That's what I'm going to believe. And if God chooses to change the rules at the last minute, they were his rules to begin with, so he has every right to change them. I just hope he doesn't change them and count me out rather than counting me in. But as long as I'm obedient to scripture, I'm doing all I can do and doing the very best I can. And by God's grace, I will have eternal life. All right. Um, the one who who who, who, obey, who sees the light, accepts the light, believes in the light. What does that tell you? That tells me that faith is necessary. That's how we get there. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the gospel. Faith in in God's saving grace. God, faith in Christ's blood shed on the cross. All of those things are what I'm relying on for my salvation, and that's what you rely on for your salvation. I cannot prove to you, there's no way I could if I did everything I know, that baptism saves me. You know that. Well, because, Roger, don't be silly. The Bible says that. Of course it does. Do you believe the Bible? Yeah. Why? Well, because that's what you do. I mean, if you're a Christian, you believe in the Bible. What else do you have to believe in? Now, well, then I'm going to believe. Very good. I commend you for that. But it's a matter of what? Faith. Because you cannot prove that the Bible is the Word of God. We believe it's the Word of God. We have different ways of showing through the Bible, how things historically match up. And it gives us confidence in the Bible, which I'm glad we have. And I'm glad God shared that with us, okay? But there's no way that I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible is the Word of God. Why? Because God didn't give me enough evidence to prove that. Why didn't he? Because he didn't want to. Why didn't he want to? Because he says, if you live successfully on this earth, in accordance with God's will, you're going to do it by what? Faith. I don't like that. I don't like that because I like a world that I can prove. We live in a world of proof. We live in a world that says, if you can't prove it, it ain't there. Until it's something we can't prove and then we use it anyway. But, but by and large, we, we believe, and our society teaches us, we, we grew up with the scientific method. And the scientific method says, if it's provable, it's real. If it's not provable, it's not real. Now, Christians come along and say, well, we don't believe that. We, we, we believe in something <clears throat> beyond what we can see, touch, feel, and so forth. Good. But the world doesn't agree with you. The world says, no, you've got to be able to prove, prove it. And without proof, it doesn't exist as far as the world's concerned. But what does a Christian say? A Christian says, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry for what I believe, but I'm sorry you don't understand 
how I can believe in something and make, make it the center of my life and not be able to physically prove it. But I accepted my faith because my, my father in heaven said, if you're going to be faithful to, if you're going to be acceptable to me, you will do it by faith. He, he has, and I will, I will challenge you um, with this thought. When Jesus became a man and lived on the earth, <clears throat> he lived by faith too. His father promised him before time began that he would die on a cross and then to be resurrected. Time came, Jesus came to the earth. Jesus lived his life. We'll talk about that for the rest of the time we have in this study. But Jesus lived on the earth, obeyed the Father, did what the Father told him, talked to the Father, had some proof of the Father's response because we know it is baptism and we know a couple of other times. And, God, God made an, an acclamation of Jesus. But when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus actually gave up the ghost <coughs> of the King James Version says, and says, it is finished, and died. <coughs> he died there expecting to be resurrected exactly the same way you and I did. Because he had no proof. He had no proof that he'd be resurrected. He believed he would be resurrected. And of course, three days later, he was. But he died the same as you and I will die, expecting to be resurrected one day when Christ returns. He expected to be resurrected in three days. But he went to the grave, not with any proof other than God said so. And yet he went to the God, he went through that and did the will of the Father and was rewarded for it, by the way. I mean, uh, he was given a name which is above all names and things like that, and everything was put under his control. But he did it on faith because he was a man. And I think sometimes we, knowing the deity that was about Jesus, we sometimes give the deity more credit of Jesus than it deserves. I mean, we're, we know he was God, so we kind of go, well, yeah, but, you know, he knew all along. No, he didn't. He didn't know it. Everything he did, he did with the Father. We'll talk about it later. But when he gets to uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, he prays to God to give him the power to do it. Why didn't he just do it? Because he had to rely on God for the power to do the miracles that he did. Well, plus everything he did was for us. Right. All right. And prove, and every all the miracles he did was to prove what? Who he was and that what he said was from God. That's why he didn't cure everybody. That's why he didn't raise all the dead or uh, uh, give sight to all the blind people on the face of the earth. He gave less sight to the people he gave sight to, not because they needed to see something or because they were special, but they were at the right place at the right time for him to prove what he needed to prove, and that was who he was, and that what he said was from God. So we'll stop there, and uh, I'm 